I'm Clark Phillips, and I'm the Dean of the College, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Comparing Access to Constitutional Justice in Australia <coughs> and Canada, a lecture by Patrick Kaiser, who's Professor of Law and Public Policy at the Pearl University in Melbourne. And this lecture is presented as part of the Matricia Lecture Series. As we gather here today, we're acknowledging the 36 territory and the whole land of the Métis people. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'd like to begin by thanking Mercutia LLP for sponsoring our lecture theater, lecture series for the past five years, allowing the college to continue to present a wide range of speakers. And Dr. Patrick Kaiser, clerk for the Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia from 1996 to 1998, practicing the virus since 1999, including in the High Court of Australia and of the United Nations Human Rights Committee. In 2010, he shortlisted for the Australian Human Rights Award for his extensive pro bono work on behalf of people with disabilities, indigenous peoples, and prisoners. In 2015, he was president of the Australasian Law Teachers Association, now the Australian Law Academics Association. And in 2016, he was admitted as a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. He's currently working on a series of radio programs and podcasts with the national broadcaster, the ABC, telling the stories behind significant constitutional decisions of the High Court of Australia. Uh, as part of the ABC's Radio National's History Lesson Program, and it will be broadcast in early 2020, is that correct? So I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Patrick Kaiser to the college. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Martin. And um, can I join you in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we gathered on today and, and pay my respect to their elders um, past, present and emerging? Um, and also thank uh, McKercher LLP for their sponsorship of this lecture series. Can I also um, thank the Global Ambassador Program here at uh, the University of Saskatchewan for funding my visit, which uh, I've really enjoyed a lot. Um, it, it's a wonderful law school. I love the fact that it's built around a law library. Um, I think that's excellent. And I've been using the library over the last uh, few days, and it's, it's quite excellent. Um, I'd like to thank um, Professor Glenn Luther, who isn't with us at the moment because he's up in uh, Nunavut, um, and uh, Dr. Mansfield uh, Meller, uh, who's with us, um, and thank to, thanks to both of you for sponsoring my, um, uh, my um, involvement in this Global Ambassador Program. And um, warmly welcome you and say thank you for coming to my lecture when you had the opportunity to go to a sweat lodge instead. Um, when I uh, found out what a sweat lodge was about 10 minutes ago, I actually uh, would prefer to be at the sweat lodge myself. So um, I um, uh, apologise for taking you away from that, which sounds like a wonderful initiative uh, and is obviously reflective of the, um, uh, the, um, the efforts by this law school and this university to ensure connectedness between Indigenous culture and, uh, and your practices here, which I think is a, is a wonderful thing. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, access to constitutional justice in Australia and Canada. Um, and uh, of course, to the extent that I'll be speaking about Canada, I, I warmly welcome your input and feedback uh, and correction uh, if I uh, should go astray, um, because it's, uh, I've only been in your country for about um, uh, 10 days, so uh, I'm sure I've got a lot to learn, so I'd welcome your, um, welcome your input. And uh, as you can see, I've been having fun with uh, PowerPoint there. So the question that I posed, and which was on the posters, um, is what happens when a person seeks access to constitutional justice because of their identity? And I, when I say constitutional justice, um, access to constitutional justice, the doctrines that I'll be focusing on are the doctrines of standing and costs. Um, for example, a person who's indigenous seeks to challenge the constitutional validity of legislation that affects them specifically because they're indigenous. And um, uh, so I'll be exploring this idea in Australia and also in um, Canada. Uh, and um, I've, uh, I'll also be talking about some material I covered in a book I wrote uh, back in 2010 called Open Constitutional Courts, which uh, uh, explores this. But um, I'm an, as I said before, I'm a neophyte in uh, uh, Canadian matters, so uh, I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb today, so uh, if you want to saw the branch off, I'd welcome your input. Um, uh, we'll start with a bit of a roadmap. Uh, I've got three things I want to cover. Firstly, standing in costs in Australia, 
uh, then standing in costs in Canada, and then I want to theorize constitutional identity and talk to you about some uh, philosophies and theories which might help inform a wider understanding of the, the function of uh, standing rules in both of our societies and also uh, the function of costs rules in constitutional cases specifically. Well, firstly, um, we've got uh, strong constitutional similarities, uh, and I know that many of you have been to Australia or have studied Australian law um, in the course of your academic work, uh, so it won't surprise you to see this list of strong similarities. Um, a dispossession of Indigenous peoples and an ongoing dialogue about um, how to um, uh, involve Indigenous people um, in law and ensure we have indigenous infused perspectives on law. Um, we're both former British colonies, which means we've got uh, concepts like parliamentary uh, sovereignty and the like in common. Uh, common law systems, of course. Uh, and um, Australian federalism was partly modelled on Canadian federalism, uh, with, um, but we have enumerated powers at the federal level only uh, with residual uh, a, a sort of a wide residual power for the states. Um, uh, but it means we've got similar constitutional issues. And of course, uh, we've got separate and independent courts with a power of judicial review of legislative action, unlike um, the uh, Brits, of course, who, um, uh, who, where you can't strike down legislation. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the Supreme Court there can't do uh, interesting things, as those of you who've read the Miller case uh, no, recently would uh, would learn. The big difference uh, between our two countries is is uh, the Canadian commitment to uh, human rights and its constitutional law, uh, and um, it's uh, it, it it really is uh, uh, as as an Australian who've who's met many Canadians and visited your country on a number of occasions. Um, from my point of view, uh, Canada's commitment to human rights and its constitutional law is really a defining characteristic of your civic culture. I, I know that as people with a lived experience of Canada, uh, many of you might identify other aspects of Canada's legal or political culture as more emblematic. Uh, but from my perspective, the Canadian Charter is as emblematic of your legal culture as the maple leaf is a symbol of your country. Um, and um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a, a law school in, in Australia um, at a university called Bond University. Um, and it's, um, uh, it's known by many Canadian law students as Last Chance University. Um, so if you, <laughs> if you don't get into a Canadian law school, you'd go to Bond University on the Gold Coast. Uh, now, I taught at that law school for seven years. It's quite a good law school. And um, I met a lot of Canadian students when I was teaching there. Um, and um, they expressed a lot of surprise and indeed alarm uh, at the uh, paucity of constitutional human rights protection in Australia. Um, and uh, this uh, was reinforced for me um, a couple of days ago. I had the good fortune to um, uh, visit your classic uh, uh, law program uh, over the other side of Saskatoon and um, meet with um, some people there, some prisoners' rights um, advocates and activists who are setting up a Saskatchewan prison law group uh, and they were exploring what they might do in that group uh, and it was interesting hearing them go talk about their casework and their caseload and how um, after they exhausted all of the administrative law remedies that their um, prisoner clients had sought how they'd be able to take that second step and talk about the charter so uh, they, they, they always, always had that fallback position of being able to raise charter arguments uh, which is something that we don't have in Australia. Um, being a human rights lawyer in Australia is a little bit like that knight in that Monty Python movie where they've cut up off both of his arms and his legs and he's just bleeding on the ground and he says, come back here and I'll bite your ankles or something like that. Uh, I'll bite your legs off. Um, that's what it's like <laughs> being a human rights lawyer in Australia. Um, and indeed, I think it's really the absence of human rights protection in our constitutional law that is most emblematic uh, of our constitutional law. Um, uh, um, disappointed to report. So that's really the big difference. So let's turn to talk about standing in Australia and um, a, a leading case on standing in Australia is the Australian Conservation Foundation and the Commonwealth. The Australian Conservation Foundation is, as the uh, name suggests, uh, a significant organisation in Australia that is concerned with 
uh, conservation. It was actually set up by a former Chief Justice of Australia, uh, Sir Garfield Barwick, um, and has had many um, distinguished uh, chairs, including Peter Garrett, who was the lead singer for Midnight Oil, um, and, um, and also a, polit a Labor politician for a brief period of time a few years ago. Um, so the ACF uh, was a, a, an agency that had been set up as a not-for-profit um, corporation under uh, Australian law, um, and it had been involved um, in various uh, reviews of uh, environmental impact statement assessments and the like, and the Minister for the Environment consulted the ACF on matters relating to uh, uh, the environment. It um, was concerned about a development that was taking place in Queensland, one of our states. Uh, it was a, a tourism uh, development and the ACF was anxious about the impact that this development might have on a sensitive habitat. Uh, so they sought uh, relief, um, injunctive relief in um, administrative law, but also they uh, raised constitutional questions in their brief. The matter was removed to the High Court uh, and the High Court considered whether the ACF had standing and they uh, applied the special interest test, which is the dominant test on standing in Australia. A person must have a special interest and a special interest will be established by a proprietary or pecuniary interest in the matter or an interest that is greater than that of an ordinary member of the public but not a mere intellectual or emotional concern. So the ACF was told that they would not have standing because they only had a mere intellectual or emotional concern in the protection of the environment. Um, so uh, not much has changed um, in the years since, but I just wanted to um, uh, hit you over the head with this large block of text um, from uh, the judgment of Justice Gibbs, as he then was. He later became Chief Justice of Australia. Um, and this is... Um, uh, Justice Gibbs' rationale for the special interest test. I would not deny that a person might have a special interest in the preservation of a particular environment. And there he was thinking about someone who lives next door to a place, um, uh, echoing the sort of old public nuisance cases uh, of English standing law. However, an interest for present purposes does not mean a mere intellectual or emotional concern. A belief however strongly felt that the law generally or a particular law should be observed or that conduct of a particular kind should be prevented does not suffice to give its possessor locus standi. So he was not prepared to consider citizen standing uh, of the sort that um, you would be familiar with in a case like Thorson and the post Thorson cases in Canada. Let's touch on um, another standing case uh, in Australia that was decided a few years after the ACF case, and that's a case called Davis and the Commonwealth. Really quite a remarkable case. Um, so um, uh, just um, some elements from Australian history. So in 1788, the um, first fleet arrived in Sydney Cove uh, to um, commence the use of uh, the Australian continent as a penal colony. Um, and um, uh, going a few years further back, in 1770, uh, Captain James Cook uh, discovered Australia. Of course, there were Indigenous people in Australia who'd been there for 60,000 years, at least, by the time he arrived, but that didn't prevent Cook from claiming Terra Australis for uh, the English. Uh, and then Captain Arthur Phillip um, sailed the first fleet of um, prison ships to Sydney Cove in 1788. And they arrived on January the 26th in 1788, which is uh, still celebrated as Australia Day, although there is um, uh, an increasing amount of public support for changing the day uh, because an increasing number of Australians uh, uh, recognise that um, January the 26th, 19, um, uh, January the 26th may not be a day of celebration for Indigenous people in Australia. Uh, Davis himself was an Aboriginal protester who was um, campaigning against the celebration of the bicentenary of uh, the arrival of the First Fleet in 1988. And um, he challenged the constitutional validity of legislation uh, that had been enacted by the Australian Parliament in 1980, which set up an organisation called the Australian Bicentenary Authority Act. 
Now, the, Bicent the, the Bicentenary Authority, as the name uh, uh, indicates, uh, suggests, was set up to commemorate the Bicentenary. And the idea was that um, this uh, government-held statutory corporation would uh, pay for itself by um, making money from souvenirs or licensing uh, uh, souvenirs and the production of souvenirs uh, for the Bicentenary. So the Australian government, uh, as part of this legislation, used its powers uh, uh, with respect to trademarks to um, vest exclusive uh, rights of use um, to a number of phrases in the Australian Bicentenary Authority that it could then on license to um, uh, other folk. And uh, Davis and uh, his um, uh, fellow um, Aboriginal activist protesters had published uh, various posters but also printed T-shirts which spoke about 200 years of dispossession and shame. So they were engaged in uh, a, a freedom of expression, essentially. Uh, but um, something that you may not be aware of is that uh, Australia doesn't have constitutionally, uh, uh, expressly constitutionally protected freedom of expression. Um, although um, a, a second case involving Davis was actually the first case where a majority of the High Court recognised there might be an implied freedom of expression in respect of political and governmental matters. This particular uh, case uh, at that citation was um, a case about standing and it was about whether Davis had standing and Davis argued that he had standing because of his identity as an Aboriginal person, that he had a unique interest uh, in um, Australia Day and its celebration. He had a unique interest in um, the... Uh, in, um, a unique, unique interest in standing to challenge the constitutional validity of the celebration and commemoration uh, of Australia Day as an Aboriginal person, as a person um, who had experienced um, and was a um, successor of um, Aboriginal people in Australia uh, who had experienced um, uh, dispossession and other um, injustices. Um, in particular, uh, the, um, they argued that as Aboriginal people they had a special interest. They said that the proclamations of sovereignty made by Captain James Cook in 1770 and Captain Arthur Phillip in 1788 and the establishment of a penal colony at Sydney Cove dispossessed the Indigenous Aboriginal people of their traditional land. These events were precursors to the extermination and genocide of Aboriginal people, the forced abandonment of traditional customs, the establishment of racially segregated reserves, the forced taking of children from Aboriginal families, and many other indignities and deprivations. Another block of text from now Chief Justice Gibbs to uh, hit you over the head with. Um, this is from uh, his judgment in Davis and the Commonwealth. A strong belief on the part of the plaintiffs that the act is offensive and undesirable, as well as unconstitutional, would not in itself give them standing to challenge its validity. As at present advised, although I agree that the plaintiffs as Aborigines are members of a class which may have a special interest in challenging the validity of the Act, I find difficulty in accepting that the interest is other than emotional or intellectual, which is uh, the point at which um, I take an intake of breath. Uh, um, now, some scholars would say this is a long time ago, uh, a reasonably long time ago, it feels like yesterday to me, um, but, um, and perhaps uh, Australian mores have changed and uh, judges uh, have, a, have a better um, sense of listening uh, and considering the, um, the difficult position uh, that these plaintiffs um, were uh, under in considering and the, the significance of their identity claim. Uh, but uh, what happened was uh, this was a, a strikeout application and the Chief Justice uh, said that he wouldn't strike out the application but in the ultimate hearing uh, none of the judges considered standing. So we're in this position that perhaps we can say that sub silentio uh, the court as a whole accepted their standing but we'll never know because uh, they didn't so, uh, say so specifically. So it's certainly not... Um, uh, 
the um, citizen standing uh, of Thorson and the post Thorson uh, variety. In subsequent cases, the High Court really has failed to further elucidate the test. There's one case called Croom in Tasmania decided in 1997 where they granted standing to um, Rodney Croom, who was a gay activist from Tasmania, uh, challenging um, the uh, constitutional validity of Tasmanian criminal code provisions that made sex between consenting uh, males a crime. And uh, federal legislation had been enacted and he wanted to run a supremacy clause um, argument that the Tasmanian law would be invalidated to the extent of its inconsistency. We've got three, three judges in that case who said that, uh, um, that, that Croom had standing because he might be prosecuted. Some scholars have said, well, perhaps that's creating a, a right to know, which has got a similar um, envelope to um, Thorson-style um, citizen standing, but we don't know. Uh, and unfortunately, the High Court hasn't further elucidated that. And that means that at present, uh, the safest bet, and indeed there are some recent cases that reinforce this, um, the safest bet is to say that the special interest test um, is still good law. I love that expression, uh, good law. It doesn't mean it's actually good, um, but it's, it's good law. And that's plainly not uh, Thorson style standing. So I'm, I've taken you through standing, uh, an outline of standing in Australia and now costs. Uh, the loser pays uh, the winner's costs, so it's the ordinary rule of civil procedure is applied in constitutional cases. Um, and of course, this can uh, create real difficulty for a constitutional litigant. I'll just quickly mention um, a case called North Australian Aboriginal Legal Aid Service in Bradley. Uh, that was a case um, that started in the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory. It was a challenge to the constitutional validity of the appointment of the Chief Magistrate of the Northern Territory, which is our territory that's similar to your Northwest Territories. Um, there had been some doubt in Australian constitutional law whether the um, uh, judicial independence provisions in the federal constitution applied in the territories, because we know that territory constitutional law has sometimes been cut adrift from uh, the rest of constitutional law in federal um, systems, certainly in the United States and Australia. So there was a, a significant question whether uh, the appointment of the Chief Magistrate of the Northern Territory, he'd been appointed uh, until retirement, but only with, a, only with a guarantee of two years of remuneration at the time of his appointment. Uh, and there were concerns that that two year pay deal uh, might place him in a position of looming dependency uh, on the executive in the Northern Territory. So the North Australian Aboriginal Legal Aid Service, which has many clients that come before the Chief Magistrate of the Northern Territory, uh, started a constitutional challenge. It went to the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory, the Northern Territory Court of Appeal, and then the High Court on a strikeout motion. The High Court didn't strike out the matter. Uh, and then it went back down to the bottom, Supreme Court, cross-vested to the Federal Court, full Federal Court, High Court, many um, hearings on interlocutory matters relating to public interest immunity, uh, relating to contempt of court. There were 17 hearings uh, in seven different uh, courts in this case, and finally it got to the Australian High Court. And as you might imagine, uh, the, the Aboriginal Legal Service were very worried that if they lost the case in the High Court, uh, that there would be an adverse costs order uh, against them. I was one of the counsel for the Aboriginal Legal Service in this case. Uh, and we were really anxious about this because uh, uh, we thought we had a good case, but um, you know, you're, there's always a little bit of doubt, uh, especially in constitutional matters, um, because often uh, doctrinal developments in constitutional law matters may involve the analysis of cases that have been decided many years ago. So there's always just a little bit of doubt. Um, and the overhang, uh, the, the fear, the spectre of an adverse cost order is something that really um, affects how you um, manage uh, litigation. It has a chilling effect on constitutional litigation. Um, uh, as it turned out, um, in that case, uh, the court made no order as no order as to costs um, because we won two of the three points that we made, but we uh, we lost the case unfortunately. Um, that's one of uh, four cases I've done in the High Court. I've lost three of them. I, um, first case I did in the High Court, I lost 7-0. And uh, the second one, I, I lost 6-1. to one. So I thought, okay, I'm 
going in the right direction. But then the third one, I lost 7 0. So, you know. Fortunately, I won the last one 4 to 1. So I'm, uh, I'm feeling vindicated. Uh, but I have a lot of experience with the loser pays rule, or at least my clients in constitutional matters do. Um, uh, the, the loser pays rule has a lot of justifications. Um, we'd, we'd all be familiar with, with these in different contexts. Um, it's said to compensate the winner. It deters frivolous, vexatious, or un, unmet, I should say unmeritorious litigation. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times you go over your slides, you'll always have one problem. Um, it allows people to litigate if that is, if one side, if, if a plaintiff is willing to, plaintiff's lawyers are willing to work on a no win, no fee basis. It's said to deter delay and encourage settlement and it stops a floodgate of litigation. Now I'm not, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to return to this slide and try and debunk these uh, propositions a little bit later, at least when it comes to constitutional litigation. But these are the traditional justifications. Uh, I'll be arguing later that they really don't apply in constitutional cases. All right, let's talk about Canada. And here um, I'm grateful for your uh, correction, which can happen immediately or at the end. It's entirely up to you. Um, I um, will st start with Smith and Ontario, which um, you probably um, recall is, is a case involving um, a, a fellow named Smith uh, who lived in Ontario. Um, sought to import some beer and liquor uh, from Quebec uh, in um, defiance of the Canadian temperance law that had recently been enacted. And um, uh, he uh, sought a declaration that the Canadian temperance law was uh, constitutionally invalid. He said he wanted to avoid the, um, uh, the spectre of being exposed to criminal prosecution for taking steps um, inconsistently with that law. And um, the reason I've included this uh, picture of Duff Beer, uh, those of you who are devotees of The Simpsons would probably be aware of this brand, um, is it reminds me that the leading judgment in this case was delivered by Justice Duff, uh, with whom Justice McLean agreed. And there's a McLean Scotch. Uh, so there you go. I found that out on the weekend when I was uh, preparing my slides. So Justices Duff and McLean in their joint judgment say it's necessary for a person to be exceptionally prejudiced by a piece of legislation. You, uh, you, you can't just have uh, anybody uh, challenging, um, uh, starting a constitutional challenge. You have to be exceptionally prejudiced. Uh, and as, uh, according to these judges, um, Smith had not satisfied that test. A third uh, judgment um, was delivered by, and if I welcome your um, contribution on the pronunciation of this, Mino, am I, is that cl close enough? Justice Mino uh, delivered a judgment saying that the test was the special interest test, um, which means Australian uh, law has now caught up to where you were in 1924. Um, and uh, Justice Idington uh, went for the traditional public law model, which was that a person should go to the Attorney General of the relevant uh, province or perhaps uh, to the Federal Attorney General and seek their fiat to run a relator action uh, to um, challenge the constitutional validity of legislation. Um, they'd obviously never met uh, William Barr. Um, and, um, and then uh, Chief Justice Davies died before judgment was delivered, perhaps drinking too much of the uh, beer and the scotch. Of course, um, you're all familiar with uh, Thorson's case, uh, no doubt. Um, a law professor, a law dean, a parliamentarian. Uh, what, what couldn't he do? Um, well, he wasn't fond of the Official Languages Act um, and campaigned against it. Um, and uh, I've just taken a, a, um, a passage from the judgment of um, Justice Laskin at about three-tenths of the way down page 19. Uh, with whom um, uh, a majority of the court agreed. And um, in that case, it was acknowledged that, in, that constitutional cases are different to the old English public nuisance cases. Uh, and that in a, a federal um, system like Canada, uh, where there are multiple attorneys general, uh, and the job of the Supreme Court is to ensure that uh, polities stay within their constitutional limits, uh, 
and there's judicial review of legislative action, all those in old English cases really uh, don't, ought not be applied. Uh, and there's also a strong sense in the judgment uh, of um, Justice Laskin in the Thorson case um, that you know, in constitutional cases, you know, you're not just talking about proprietary and pecuniary interests. Um, and if you dig back into those early standing cases uh, from the um, 19th century and the early 20th century that were relied on in Smith and Ontario, you see actually a very strong sense that the, they are the product of Victorian England, where um, whether you had property or money was really the essence of society. Um, you know, it was the, the class system uh, was really the essence of society at, at that time. And uh, it's reflected in the standing rules that were developed and applied by the courts. But misapplied, well not misapplied, just um, inappropriately applied in constitutional cases where you're talking about something different. It's about whether a citizen has a genuine interest in uh, challenging something. And, and the cases are different. Uh, you know, you consider a case like Nova Scotia Board of Censors and McNeil, where you've got McNeil was uh, editor of a local newspaper in Nova Scotia. Um, he wanted to see Last Tango in Paris, uh, which was a mov movie that came out in 1974. Um, I haven't seen the movie, but I've read about it, and it sounds awful, frankly. Um, but, uh, you know, he wanted to see it, and the provincial censor had made a decision that the movie shouldn't be shown. Uh, he challenged that decision. He took his case to the uh, lieutenant governor of the province. Um, he sought um, the attorney general's fiat for a relator action to challenge the constitutional validity of the uh, of the um, legislation authorising the provincial censor to undertake his work, um, and had been denied. And so the court unanimously uh, applied the um, Laskin approach to standing. Um, in Thorson's case, and granted standing. So, seems like you've got settled law um, after that case. But, uh, of course, uh, to the victor go the spoils. Um, so, the next major standing case, of course, is the Borowski case. Um, I understand that Joseph Borowski was from Saskatchewan, and he was an uh, anti-choice advocate um, here in Saskatchewan. Um, and he... Uh, took steps to challenge the constitutional validity uh, of um, provisions of the criminal code uh, which authorised therapeutic abortions uh, as against the um, section one of the Canadian uh, Bill of Rights, which includes a guarantee to individual life. Um, now, in uh, the test case on standing that emerged, uh, Justice Martland um, had the opportunity to consider Laskin's test in Thorson. Now, uh, Laskin, now Chief Justice, dissented in the Borowski case, uh, and uh, Martland had only concurred with Laskin in the Thorson case. But because Martland here was speaking on behalf of a clear majority, um, to the victor go the spoils. So the Martland's characterization of the principles in Thorson are the principles that get carried into the future as the rules of standing. Um, and um, he, uh, Justice Martland um, uh, said that, um, uh, char characterized uh, the um, uh, Laskin's judgment in Thorson in the following t terms. Um, and also, considering the um, uh, Nova Scotia uh, McNeil case, said it went beyond the Thorson judgment in that it recognised the possibility of a person having status to attack the validity of legislation in the circumstances defined in that case, even though there, were, there, there existed classes of persons who were especially affected and who might be exceptionally prejudiced by it. So this is the test. Uh, according to Martland, I interpret these cases as deciding that to establish status as a plaintiff in a suit seeking a declaration that legislation is invalid, if there is a serious issue as to its invalidity, a person need only to show that he or she is affected by it directly or that he or she has a genuine interest as a citizen in the validity of the legislation and that it is no other reasonable and effective manner in which the issue may be brought before the court, um, which is really a, a remarkable uh, step forward, I think, uh, towards uh, citizen standing. And this is uh, said at the bottom of page 604 to the top of page 
605. Um, the most uh, recent case that I've read on standing in Canada um, indicates that there's been a slight uh, variation of that third component th of the test. It's no longer a no reasonable and effective test, uh, but only, there's only a need for the proposed litigation to be a reasonable and effective means to bring the challenge to court. So it really is quite a remarkable um, difference between standing in Canada and standing in Australia, recalling that standing in Australia is only about uh, whether you have a special interest uh, and a mere intellectual or emotional concern is uh, insufficient. Um, here, uh, the courts have gone right beyond that very patronising language that's used by um, uh, uh, Justice Gibbs and then Chief Justice Gibbs in Australia. Um, and really, it's about the citizen. It's about the genuine interest as a citizen. Uh, and um, that's a good thing, I think. Well, costs in, a, in Canadian uh, constitutional cases, I'm going to take some shortcuts here, and I've relied a little bit on um, Kent Roach's uh, constitutional remedies in Canada, loosely. If you forgive me for that, I'm going to be reading the costs cases in detail this week, but I relied on the loose leaf. Um, uh, you have this wonderful thing called advanced costs in, uh, in this country. We don't have that uh, in Australia. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on departures from the ordinary rule just because as a comparativist on, for today's lecture, we need to compare like with like. So I'm going to be focusing on departures from the rule. Um, I'm not sure whether this analysis uh, passes muster, but certainly um, it appears to me uh, a, a very reasonable approach to these sorts of issues. And, um, uh, and Roach has um, drawn attention to the work of a judge in Ontario, uh, which seems to me to be perfectly reasonable, um, that questions the sort of um, application of the uh, floodgates metaphor in constitutional litigation. And questions, really, um, uh, whether you should really uh, have cost orders awarded in anything other than circumstances where a person is engaged in vexatious uh, litigation. Uh, and that's, uh, I took a similar approach in uh, open constitutional courts, which is about the Australian scheme. So I wanted to now return to costs, that cost slide uh, from earlier, and give you an opportunity to um, dive in if you'd like to do that and give me some feedback. I've taken that slide and I've crossed out the material which was on the previous slide and provided a counter-argument uh, next to it. So firstly, costs, the loser pay, pays rule is said to be justified on the basis that it compensates the winner. I guess my fundamental issue uh, with that argument is that it's expecting the litigant to pay for a government to behave lawfully. Uh, and in my opinion, um, that's what governments should be doing anyway. Uh, and governments that uh, we, we're all familiar with how public law operates and how um, public law is practiced by our solicitors general and by the teams of lawyers that they have that examine legislation by the federal government or provincial governments. They would have very high quality public lawyers go through their legislation line by line to make sure that it's entirely constitutionally valid or at least arguably constitutionally valid. Um, so they're ready for a constitutional challenge. Are we really putting them to considerable expense uh, when we invite them to have, you know, we, when we test uh, the constitutional validity of their legislation? In my view, as taxpayers, we've already paid for our legislation to be valid. Uh, and requiring a government to uh, be put to proof on that point is... Uh, is not a, uh, a is not a sufficient justification for the loser pays rule, in my opinion. Um, secondly, um, sometimes you see this uh, this um, the language of the floodgates arise in constitutional cases, um, and uh, I think it's often misplaced. Um, I, I, I don't think people engage in constitutional litigation for frivolous or vexatious reasons. Um, I. I I know there are outlier cases, so I'm familiar with a line of cases in Australia where 
uh, people might have been declared bankrupt or, um, and, and they, they say, um, this is against the Magna Carta, you know, and they trundle off to court and, and uh, run that sort of argument. Um, and there's actually a surprising number, a surprisingly large number of cases like that in Australia. In fact, there's a, um, a fellow who died recently uh, who called himself Prince Leonard, uh, and he uh, had this huge uh, property in Western Australia, and he said that it was an independent principality, uh, and he declined to pay Australian taxes for a period of time. Um, you know, eventually he had to pay his taxes. Uh, but, um, you know, aside from those outlier cases where you have those, uh, uh, those outlier crazy cases, you know, the, the sort of people who run public interest constitutional challenges aren't running these challenges for frivolous or vexatious reasons. So I have to question uh, that rationale for the loser pays for all. Thirdly, um, personally, I think that we should have public funding for public interest litigation. Uh, and I can understand that some people might see that as rent-seeking for the left. Um, on the other hand, um, I do think that um, ensuring fidelity to the Constitution is a laudable and worthy um, goal in both of our societies, and it's uh, something that could be supported by a system like that. Deterring delay and encouraging settlement. You can't settle a constitutional point. You know, something's either constitutional or unconstitutional. It's not something you settle as if you say, okay, well, if we give you 50,000, is that enough? I mean, I remember uh, in, in the uh, North Australian Aboriginal Legal Aid Service in Bradley, after we'd done about 11 of the 17 hearings, it was actually seriously proposed by the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory that Prime Minister Bob Hawke uh, be wheeled in to negotiate a settlement in that dispute. What, I mean, Bob Hawke was a great Prime Minister and a great Australian, but what would he add to a constitutional decision. I mean, he can't make the constitutional decision. We could only get that from a court. We could only get that from the High Court. Um, uh, fifthly, large-scale disregard of the rule would lead to a flood of litigation. But frankly, I think that that is a red herring. Um, I, I, um, and, I, and I guess I've reached a conclusion after um, working in the High Court and practicing um, constitutional law in Australia for 25 years. Um, it, it, you're not going to have a flood of litigation because you still need to raise the serious, arguable question of constitutional law. And if you have a serious, arguable question of constitutional law, then why shouldn't you have, have standing? Um, I think that the loser pays rule has a chilling effect on constitutional litigation. I've seen it firsthand. I think that it's punitive. I think it's the equivalent of kicking a person when they're down. Um, and um, frankly, I think that the loser pays rule tips the scales of constitutional justice in too far in favour of governments who can then pour lots and lots of money into very um, uh, high cost um, legal representation uh, and that this, and this can be uh, very bad for public interest litigants. And I heard the other day that some barristers in Melbourne are charging $33,000 a day for legal advice. So um, I think I made a wrong turning in my career somewhere. Um, but that's also, I think, obnoxious. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but um, that's, that's what I heard. Um, so. so let me just end with a, a bit of re-theorising. And I want to start with Jennifer Nadelsky, who's at Osgoode Hall now, and um, uh, a wonderful scholar and legal philosopher. Um, she always talks about um, uh, discourse ethics uh, and about um, ensuring we have open conversations in, um, in any part of what we do. I don't think constitutional law should be anywhere different. Uh, she talks about the need to ensure that whenever uh, we um, have a constitutive we, uh, that we're careful not to exclude the they. Uh, and I think that that's um, a, a really good perspective to keep in mind when we're looking at standing in constitutional cases, especially if the outcome of our standing decisions are to deny standing to an Indigenous person, as in Davis and the Commonwealth, to, uh, to protest uh, the bicentenary of uh, the arrival of the First Fleet in Australia, just for example, or um, to say to a, um, a gay activist who's challenging the constitutional validity of 
of homophobic legislation that they can't do that unless they are prosecuted uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so what sort of world are we creating with standing rules? Are we just um, perpetuating the rights of uh, the propertied uh, and those with um, substantial financial means? And I think that that's a legitimate question to ask. Another, um, since I'm in Canada, I thought I'd talk about more Canadians. Um, uh, Charles Taylor, of course, um, who you're all familiar with. Um, and, uh, and Charles Taylor in the politics uh, of identity um, it talks about um, individual identity and the formation of that identity. And I don't see any reason why those ideas can't be applied in the context of standing. Uh, a, a notion of constitutional identity. That is that um, we, we, we have our identities within our lives and to the extent that we want to realise our identity within constitutional discourse, we shouldn't be deprived of the opportunity to do that uh, because we fail to have uh, what the common law courts or some common law courts have called a special interest. Um, uh, I, um, uh, in, in, in open constitutional courts, um, I deploy um, the philosophy of Charles Taylor in, in, in developing the ideas about identity in that book. And in particular, this notion of non-recognition uh, that comes, uh, comes up in the standing cases and to some extent misrecognition. Uh, our constitutional law should embrace input from all of us. Uh, and standing rules shouldn't be a barrier to that, and nor should rules governing costs. Uh, it shouldn't be, constitutional law shouldn't just be a preserve or a place for the people with the money, um, uh, and uh, it should be possible for any person, any association, um, to access constitutional justice and not be, not experience the chilling effect uh, of uh, the risk of an adverse uh, cost order. Our equal state in constitutional law, I think, is grounded in the fact that constitutional law is the law by and through which all of us constitute ourselves as a society and realise ourselves, our individual and collective identities. Uh, and for those reasons, I think that constitutional law should allow opportunities for us to ensure fidelity to our constitutions. And I think um, uh, um, this is a, a, a quote I really like from an American judge named William Brennan, um, uh, which emphasises uh, the point that um, it's only when remaining open uh, to, um, uh, to the contributions that can be made by every person in a polity uh, that you, um, you really realise your constitutional responsibility as a judge uh, in, in, a, in a democracy. So... Uh, I'll leave this slide up there. This is my conclusion. Um, I think, uh, in conclusion, that um, Australia would do well to adopt the Canadian approach to standing. Uh, there, um, even though I recognise that the Canadian Charter is a significant constitutional difference between our countries, I don't think that that difference uh, in and of itself uh, would preclude the Australian adoption of your um, principles. Uh, the um, uh, Thorson case wasn't a charter case. Uh, we could adopt the Thorson principle because it's a principle that was developed in a uh, federal system which is, uh, is, is really very similar to our own. I don't think cost rules should be applied in constitutional cases at all, uh, which places me out on the radical uh, end of constitutionalists in my country. Uh, and I also think that public funding should be made available to constitutional challenges uh, once they've demonstrated that they have raised a, an arguable question of constitutional law and have adopted some of the language of the third limb of the um, Borowski test there. And that's what I think. What do you think? Sure.
Yes, a serious, arguable question of law. Sure. Uh, well, look, there are plenty of examples of that, um, and and you know, um, that's you know the Canadian standing cases do talk about the arguable question, uh, but really, I mean, that's designed to screen out all of the I've just been made bankrupt, and so I'm going to sue you under the Magna Carta cases, right? Okay, so that's out. But once you've got once you've raised an arguable question, well, that's arguable, then it should go to the next place which is to a constitutional court. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm sort of relying a little bit on the fact that your court, your Supreme Court, has um, opened up standing to such a considerable degree compared to the Australian cases that um, your country is the example of how the floodgates haven't opened. But if you look at the cases, I mean, if you look at the cases that have been considered by your Supreme Court over the last 10 years, and the sorts of identity claims that have been raised in those cases, there's nothing like that in Australia. And you sort of have to wonder how many identity claim cases aren't going on in Australia just because people are worried about the effect of an adverse cost order or that they might not get standing. Well, okay, so let me, let me go back a step and say this. Um, so this case um, in Australia, Davis, what happened um, was it went to a full court hearing in 1988, ironically enough, and um, a majority of the court uh, decided that the trademark's power uh, should not be interpreted in a way uh, so as to limit freedom of political expression. Okay, so now I used to teach intellectual property. My, rec my recollection of trademarks is once you've got a trademark over something, that's it. I mean, it's a, it's a property, an industrial property right conferred by a legislature on you. How it's used is not to the point, really. You know. um, and especially since it was contemplated that these uh, numbers and phrases would be used on souvenirs, on things, like T-shirts. Okay, so but what's interesting about the Davis case is all the constitutional lawyers in Australia read it and went, Freedom of expression, where did that come from? And so four years later, some constitutional lawyers went back to the Australian High Court and they were successful in persuading the High Court by majority that there is an implied freedom to discuss political and governmental affairs that operates to restrict the ambit of the enumerated legislative powers in the Australian Constitution. So even though we don't have uh, express constitutional protection of freedom of expression. We have this implied freedom to discuss political and governmental affairs and that was recognised in 1992. But this case was really the, the advanced party which set up that jurisprudence. So we do have an emerging rights and freedoms jurisprudence but it's, it's like, it's penumbra reasoning. It's all implications. So what that means is in Australia there are identity claimants, there are identity groups that want to test rights and freedoms within Australian constitutional law but they're all sitting around going, God, this could cost us a million dollars. So we're not going to do it. And I, I, I guess I'm close to that because I'm the um, barrister of last resort. to that last, oops, that one, okay, yes. <laughs> 
Um, I d look, I don't... Uh, well, two, there's two things there. Firstly, let me say, um, I don't think it would... I don't think it would be leaving the Commonwealth or becoming a republic that would make that happen. Um, Australia is a country that is, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, profoundly opposed to the notion of human rights. Full stop. <laughs> um, so um, our constitution um, included racist provisions until 1967. Uh, it still includes a racist provision. Section 25 says that if a state parliament wants to have a race-based um, electoral law, it can have that. Some constitutional scholars say, oh, yes, but a state parliament would never pass a racist uh, electoral law. Uh, so, so we don't need to get rid of it. Um, well, even if it is just a matter of symbolism, it should be out of the constitution. The fact that it isn't is, I think, a matter of great shame. Uh, but it really is emblematic to the Australian approach to human rights. Um, there are three jurisdictions, Victoria, the ACT and Queensland, interestingly enough, um, that have a statutory charter of rights. So three of our provinces have caught up to where you were in 1965. Okay, so that's a pretty good idea of where Australia is when it comes to rights. Um, we, it, we've been called the frozen continent when it comes to rights, which is <laughs> a great irony, uh, given that we're, we're a country that's roasting because of climate change. Um, so, I mean, th there's definitely... Um, what, what, what's needed is a... Um, is a strong centre-left government to get in federally and introduce a statutory charter of rights and then, and then create institutions to support it and uphold it. Um, but we just haven't had one yet. Um, and um, Australia is comfortable with the notion of legislatures protecting human rights, which means you've got this sort of piecemeal patchwork approach. So... Recently, um, the United Nations Convention on Rights of People with Disability was um, implemented through a national disability insurance scheme, uh, which is a, a well-funded scheme that advances people with disability in ways that they've never been advanced before. So I've seen the life of my nephew who's got cerebral palsy just transformed because of the funding package. Um, and I think the reason why people with disability their human rights were singled out for attention and promotion was that every person in Australia has a family member with a disability. You know, if 12% of your population has a disability, then that's a constituency. Um, but uh, in Australia, there are only 4% only four, four, four of the population are Indigenous. So they, they just lack the national traction. Um, whereas here, you've got that, the footholds and handholds that come from a charter argument from charter arguments that you can run all the time. Uh, we just don't have that. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't see human rights, uh, a statutory charter, let alone a constitutional charter happening um, anytime soon. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 and, and, and you see with the sort of, um, you know, the tide of politics how funding will 
be stripped out of those organisations and then come back into those organisations. At the moment, the, um, uh, the federal government talks about green lawfare. Okay, so they, uh, they, they, uh, they equate environmental litigation by public interest litigants with uh, warfare, uh, green warfare. And uh, so at the moment, there's a, 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 very, a vibrant debate in Australia about uh, the Minister for Home Affairs recently um, indicated that um, he wanted to investigate whether um, uh, unemployment benefits could be uh, taken from people who were involved in the recent climate strike uh, demonstrations in Australia. Um, so that's, uh, that's really where we're at in Australia at the moment. The Prime Minister came into Parliament about a, uh, a year ago with a, with a lump of coal uh, and uh, said to the opposition, don't be afraid of coal. So that's the sort of, um, you know, very Trumpian sort of political antics of our um, federal government and the opposition at the moment. So. Well, uh, look, um, so, uh, I mean, when, when the Australian Constitution um, came into force on, in January 1901, it was actually seen as quite a radical experiment in democracy because it contemplated direct choice by the people. Um, so, you know, no electoral college, no um, property franchise, no anything. Uh, and one of the first pieces of legislation enacted by the Commonwealth Parliament was an electoral act that guaranteed the votes of women. So. South Australia was the first place in the world that had uh, uh, franchise for women and uh, Australia was one of the very first countries. So it started with great promise, but um, we're, we're, we're a dualist country, so if, we, if you want to implement international human rights treaties, you have to have that piece of domestic legislation that does that. Um, and um, we, um, but we've had a, an historic legacy of you know, the dispossession of uh, and conquest of the uh, 18th and 19th century was followed by the chief protector of Aborigines, uh, which was basically a genocide um, and forced assimilation of Aboriginal people in Australia. And um, as I said before, there just hasn't been that um, constituency, the size of the constituency, and also uh, the size of the population. The voice of that population has been smothered and suppressed uh, politically um, and legally right throughout the 20th century. Um, so we just haven't had a rights culture. I'm just going to go out on a, on a limb here and say, I think one of the reasons why the, the statutory charter here and then the constitutional charter emerged and um, took um, gathered a bit of steam was because of, um, uh, because of bilingualism and because of the presence of the French in, in Quebec. You know, I mean, you, you, in, 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 in Canada, you've got this big sort of multicultural spike that kind of sits right in the middle of your country. You know, it's, and, and, and if you have, if bilingualism uh, is, you know, multiculturalism is, is the sine qua non of Canada, really. I mean, it is in Australia too. I mean, we, we're, just as multicultural, but we don't have that. Bilingualism means that everybody has to be conscious of the fact that not everybody speaks the same language and, and our cultures may be different. And so there's that immediate need to be this conscious of that, um, which I think has got a profound impact on, on the way your politics operates. That's just my impression but maybe that's just the first impression that will go away once you've schooled me differently. Um, so human rights are protected by legislation in Australia, and legislation, you know, is, has mainly been the preserve of a very particular class of people. Um, you know, we, um, I think we, we just, for the first time in Australian history, there are as many female senators as male senators in Australia. In the, in the national parliament. We've just had our first indigenous minister for indigenous affairs, you know? Um, so there's, and they, I mean, they're just, but they're quite emblematic really of where Australia is in terms of recognizing the need for the protection of human rights. So 
Um, yeah, uh, look, I'm, I'm 52. Uh, I'll be surprised if we have a, a national statutory charter before I cark it, frankly. Yeah, uh, let alone a constitutional charter. I just don't see it happening. You know, what, what would really need to happen is, um, did, did, I don't know if you, any of you watched the two, 2000 Olympics in Sydney, uh, but I was actually living there at the time, which was a lot of fun. And there's this Aboriginal runner named Kathy Freeman uh, who won the 400, the gold in the 400 metres at the Sydney Olympics. And she's, um, after, after her run, she um, grabbed a copy, she grabbed an Aboriginal flag, an Australian Aboriginal flag and an Australian flag, and she ran around the oval. And the, the, the furore, people so angry that she wasn't just with the Australian flag, that she also had the Aboriginal flag, was just mind-blowing. Um, but I've often thought that to have an Australian human rights consciousness, we would have to have a situation where someone with the gravitas of Cathy Freeman would have to experience a absolutely dreadful breach of her public breach of her human rights that made everybody go. <laughs> and I thought that for a number of years, and then a few years ago, there's an Aboriginal footballer uh, named Adam Goods who experienced that um, in, in Australia. He experienced intense racism when he was playing. And I thought, okay, this is going to be the moment. Finally, Australians are going to realise that we need to have human rights protection for people like Adam Good so that you know, we can have a more peaceable society. But not even then. So uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, I don't like it. All right. All right. Yeah, cool.